Yeah, so we talked about pseudo-labeling um, a couple of weeks ago, and this is this way of dealing with semi-supervised learning. So remember how in the state farm competition we had uh, far more unlabeled images in the test set than we had in the training set? And so the question was like, how do we take advantage of knowing something about the structure even though we don't have labels? And we learned this crazy technique called pseudo-labeling, or a combination of pseudo-labeling and knowledge, knowledge distillation, which is um, where you predict the outputs of the test set, and then you act as if those outputs were true labels, and you kind of add them in to your training. And the reason I wasn't able to actually implement that and see how it works was because we needed a way of combining two different sets of batches. And in particular, um, I think the advice I saw from, from Jeff Hinton when he wrote about um, pseudo-labeling is that you want something like one in three or one in four of your training data to come from the pseudo-labeled data and the rest to come from your real data. Um, so um, the good news is I, I built that thing and um, it was ridiculously easy. Um, this is the entire code. Um, I called it the mix iterator. Um, and it'll be uh, in our utils class um, from tomorrow. Um, and all it does is it's something where you create whatever generators of batches you like, um, and then you pass an array of those iterators to this constructor, and then every time it, some, uh, the Keras system calls next on it, it grabs the next batch from all of those sets of batches and concatenates them all together. And so what that means in practice is that uh, I tried doing pseudo-labeling, for example, on, on MNIST, because remember on MNIST we already had that, um, you know, pretty close to state-of-the-art result, um, which was, just to remind ourselves, 99.69. Um, um, so I thought, okay, well, can we improve it anymore if we use pseudo-labeling on the test set? And so to do so, um, you just do this. You grab your um, training batches as usual, using data augmentation if you want, whatever else. Um, so here's my training batches. And then you create your pseudo batches um, by saying, okay, my label, uh, my, um, uh, my data is my test set, and my labels are my predictions. And these are the predictions that I predicted that I calculated back up here. Um, so now this is the second set of batches, which is my pseudo batches. And so then passing an array of those two things to the mix iterator now creates a new batch generator, which is going to give us a few images from here and a few images from here. Um, how many? Well, however many you asked for. So in this case I was getting um, 64 from um, my training set and 64 divided by 4 uh, from my test set. Um, come to think of it, that's probably less than Hinton recommends. That probably should have been divided by three. Um, and now uh, I can use that just like any other um, generator. So then I just call model.fit generator and pass in that thing that I just created. And so what it's going to do is it's going to create a bunch of batches which will be um, uh, 64 items from my um, regular training set and um, a quarter of that number of items from my pseudo-labeled set. And uh, lo and behold, um, it gave me a slightly better score. There's only so much better we can do at this point, but that took us up to 99.72. It's worth mentioning that every 0.01% at this point is just one image, um, so we're really kind of on the edges at this, at this point, but we're, you know, this is getting even closer to the state of the art, despite the fact we're not doing any um, handwriting specific uh, techniques. Um, I also tried it on the FISH data set, um, and I realized at that point that this allows us to do something else, which is pretty neat, um, which is normally when we train on the training set and set aside a validation set, if we then want to submit to Kaggle, we've only trained on a subset of the data that they gave us. We didn't train on the validation set as well, which is not great, right? So what you can actually do is you can create, send three sets of batches to the mix iterator. You can have your regular training batches, you can have your pseudo-labeled test batches, 
And if you think about it, you could also add in some validation batches using the true labels from the validation set. So this is something you do just right at the end, you know, when you said, okay, this is a model I'm happy with, you could fine-tune it a bit using some of the real validation data. And you can see here I've got, um, out of my batch size of 64, I'm putting 44 from the training set, 4 from the validation set, and 16 from the pseudo-labeled test set. And uh, again, this worked pretty well. It got me uh, from about 110th to about 60th um, on, the, um, on the leaderboard. Uh, yes. Um, so if, if we go to CRAS documentation, there is something called sample weight. And I wonder if you can just set the sample weight to be lower for... Yeah, you can use the sample weight, but you would still have to manually construct the consolidated data set. So this is like a more convenient way where you don't have to append it all together and deal with all that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will mention that uh, I found the, the way I'm doing it seems a little slow. Um, I, I, there's some obvious ways I can speed it up. Like, I'm not quite sure why it is, but it might be because I'm like this concatenation each time is kind of having to create new memory and that takes a long time. Like, there's some obvious things I could do to try and speed it up. But uh, yeah, it's good enough and seems to do the job. So I'm pleased that we now have a way to do um, convenient pseudo-labeling in, um, in Keras and it seems to do a pretty good job. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about before we moved on to the new material today is embeddings, because um, I've had lots of questions about um, embeddings, and um, I, I think it's pretty clear that at least for some of you, some, some additional explanations would be helpful. So I wanted to start out by reminding you that when I introduced embeddings to you, the data that we had, we looked at kind of this cross-tab form of data. Um, and it, when it's in this cross-tab form, it's very easy to visualize what embeddings look like, which is, you know, for movie number 27 and user ID number 14, here is that movie ID's embedding right here, and here is that user ID's embedding right here, and so here is the dot product um, of the two right here. Um, so that was all pretty straightforward. Um, and so then all we had to do to optimize our embeddings was use the gradient descent solver that is built into um, Microsoft uh, Excel, which is called Solver, and we just told it um, what our objective is, which is this cell, and we said to minimize it, and we said to minimize it by changing uh, these sets of cells. Um, now, the data that we are given um, in the movie lens data set, however, uh, requires some manipulation to get into a cross-tab form. We're actually given it in this form. And we wouldn't want to create a cross-tab with all of this data because it would be way too big. It would be every single user times every single movie. And it would also be very inconvenient. So that's not how Keras works. Keras uses this data in exactly this format. And so let me show you how that works and what an embedding is really doing. So here is the exact same thing. Um, but I'm going to show you this using the data in the format that Keras uses it. So this is our input data. For every, uh, every rating is a row, and has a user ID, a movie ID, and a rating. Okay? And this is what an embedding matrix looks like for 15 users. So for these are the user IDs, uh, and for each user ID, here's user ID 14's embedding, and this is 29's embedding, and this is 72's embeddings. And at this stage, they're just random. They just initialize them with random numbers. So this thing here is called an embedding matrix. Uh, and here on is the movie embedding matrix. So the embedding matrix for movie 27 are these five numbers. So what happens um, when we look at user ID 14, movie ID 417, rating number 2? Well, the first thing that happens is that we have to find user ID number 14. And here it is. User ID 14 is the first thing in this array. So the index of user ID 14 is 1. So then here is the first row from the user embeddings um, uh, embedding matrix. 
Similarly, movie ID number uh, movie ID 417. We have to scroll down. Here is movie ID number 417, and it is the 14th row of this table. And so we want to return the 14th row. And so you can see here it has looked up and found that it's a 14th row, and then indexed into the table and grabbed the 14th row. And so then to calculate the dot product, we simply take the dot product of the user embedding with the movie embedding. And then to calculate the loss, we simply take the rating and subtract the prediction and square it. And then to get the total, total loss function, we just add that all up and take the square root. So the um, orange background cells are the cells which we want our SGD solver to change in order to um, minimize this cell here, and then all of the other, all of the orange bold cells are the calculated uh, cells. So when I was saying uh, last week that an embedding is simply looking up an array by an index, you can see why I was saying that, right? It's literally taking an index and it looks it up in an array and returns that row. That's that's literally all it's doing. Um, you might want to convince yourself during the week, if you haven't looked at this yet, that this is identical to taking a one-hot encoded matrix and multiplying it by an embedding matrix. That's identical to doing this kind of lookup. So we can do exactly the same thing. In this way, we can say um, data solver. Uh, we want to set uh, this cell to a minimum by changing these cells. And if I say solve, then Excel will go away and try to improve our objective. Um, and you can see it's decreasing. It's at about two and a half. Um, and so what it's doing here is it's using gradient descent to try to find ways to um, increase or decrease all of these numbers such that that IRMSE um, becomes as low as possible. Um, so that's literally all that is going on in our um, Keras example. Here, this dot product. Right? So this thing here where we said create an embedding for a user, that's just saying create something where I can look up the user ID and find their row. And this is doing the same for a movie, look up the movie ID and find its row. And this here says take the dot product once you've found the two. Um, and then this here says train a model where you take in that user ID and movie ID and try to predict the rating and use SGD to make it better and better. Oh, Excel's really going along, I'll cancel it. Um, so you can see here that it's got the root mean squared error down to 0.4. Um, so for example, the first one predicted 3, it's actually 2, predicted 4.5, it's actually 4, predicted 4.6, it's actually 5, and so forth. So you kind of get the idea of how it works. Um, word embeddings work exactly the same way. Uh, so inspired by um, one of the students who talked about this during the week, uh, I grabbed the text of uh, Green Eggs and Ham. Uh, and so here is the text of Green Eggs and Ham. I am Daniel, I am Sam, Sam I am, that Sam I am, etc. Um, and uh, I've turned uh, this poem into um, a matrix. And the way I did that was to take every unique word um, in that poem. Um, here is the ID of each of those words, just indexed from one. And so then I just uh, randomly generated an embedding matrix. Um, I equally well could have um, used uh, the downloaded love embeddings um, instead. Uh, and so then just for each word, I just look up in the list to find that word and find out what number it is. So I is number eight. And so here is the eighth row of the embedding matrix. So you can see here that we've started with a poem and we've turned it into a matrix of floats. And so the, the reason we do this is because our machine learning tools want a matrix of float, floats, not a poem. So all of the questions about like, does it matter what the word IDs are, you can see it doesn't matter at all. All we're doing is we're looking them up in this matrix 
and returning the floats. And once we've done that, we never use them again. We just use this matrix of floats. Okay, so that's what embeddings are. Um, okay, so I hope that's helpful. Feel free to ask if you have any questions, either now or at any other time, because we're going to be using embeddings throughout this class. Um, so hopefully that helped a few people clarify um, what's going on. Okay, so let's get back to recurrent neural networks. So to remind you, um, we talked about the purpose of recurrent neural networks as being really all about memory. Um, so it's really all about this um, idea of memory. Um, if we're going to handle something like recognizing a comment start and a comment end and being able to keep track of the fact that we're in a comment uh, for all of this time so that we can do modeling on this kind of structured language data, um, we're really going to need memory. Um, that allows us to handle long-term dependencies uh, and it uh, provides this stateful representation. So in general, the stuff we're talking about, we're going to be looking at things that kind of particularly need these three things. And it's also somewhat helpful just for when you have a variable length sequence. Yes, Rachel. Questions about embeddings. Um, one is, how does the size of my embedding depend on the number of unique words? So mapping green eggs and ham to five real numbers seems sufficient, but wouldn't be for all of JRR Tolkien. So your choice of how big to make your embedding matrix, as in how many latent factors to create, is one of these uh, architectural decisions, which we don't really have an answer to. Um, uh, my best suggestion, oh, there's a few. Um, one is to read the word to vec paper, um, which kind of introduced a lot of this, um, or at least took it a lot further than it had gone, and look at the difference between a 50-dimensional, 100-dimensional, 200, 300, 600-dimensional, and see look, see what are the different levels of accuracy that those different size embedding matrices created when those um, the authors of that paper provided this information. Um, so that's a quick shortcut, because other people have already experimented and provided those results for you. Um, the other is to do your own experiments. Try a few different sizes. Um, it's not really about the length of the word list. Um, it's really about the complexity of the language or other problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and that's really problem dependent and will require both your kind of intuition developed from, from reading and experimenting and also your own experiments. And what would be the range of root mean square error value to say that a model is good? Um, to say that a model is good is another um, model-specific issue. So a root mean squared error is very interpretable. It's basically how how far out is it on average. Um, so if you're, if we were finding that we were getting ratings within about 0.4. I mean, obviously this data, uh, this um, mini Excel data set is too small to really make intelligent comments, but let's say it was bigger. Um, if we're getting within 0.4 on average. That sounds like, you know, it's probably good enough to be useful for helping people find movies that they might like. Um, but there's really um, no one solution. Um, I actually wrote a whole paper uh, about this. Um, let me see if I can find it. Yeah, um, if you look up Designing Great Data Products um, and look up my name, um, this is based on uh, really mainly 10 years of work I did uh, at a company I created called Optimal Decisions Group. And Optimal Decisions Group was all about um, um, how to use predictive modeling, not just to make predictions, but to optimize actions. And this whole paper is, is about that. Um, in the end, it's really about coming up with a way to measure the benefit to your organization or to your project of getting that extra 0.1% accuracy. And um, there are some suggestions on how to do that in this paper. Okay, so we looked at 
um, uh, a kind of a, a visual vocabulary that we developed for writing down um, neural nets where um, any colored box represents a matrix of activations. Okay, so that's a really important point to remember. A colored box represents a matrix of activations. So it's, uh, it could either be the input matrix, it could be the output matrix, or it could be the matrix that comes from taking an input and putting it through like a matrix product. Um, the rectangle boxes represent inputs, the circular ones um, represent hidden, so intermediate um, activations, and the triangles represent outputs. Arrows, very importantly, represent what we'll call layer operations. And a layer operation is anything that you do to one colored box to create another colored box. And in general, it's almost always going to involve some kind of linear function like a matrix product or a convolution, and it will probably also include some kind of activation function like ReLU or softmax. Um, because the uh, activation functions are pretty unimportant in terms of detail, I started removing those from the pictures as we started to look at more complex models. Um, and then in fact, because the layer operations actually are pretty consistent, and we probably know what they are, I started removing those as well, so, that, so just to keep these simple. Um, and so we're simplifying these diagrams to try and just keep the main pieces. And as we did so, we could start to create more complex diagrams. And so we talked about a kind of language model where we would take inputs of a character, character number one and character number two, and we would try and predict character number three. Um, and so we thought one way to do that would be to create a uh, deep neural network with two layers. The character one input would go through a layer operation to create our first fully connected layer. That would go through another layer operation to create a second fully connected layer, and we would also add our second character input going through its own fully connected layer at this point. And to recall, the last important thing we have to learn is that two arrows going into a single shape means that we are adding the results of those two layer operations together. So two arrows going into a, um, into a shape represents summing up element-wise the results of these two layer operations. Okay, so this was the kind of little visual vocabulary that we set up last week. Um, and I've kind of kept track of it down here as to what the things are, in case you forget. So now I wanted to point out something um, really interesting, which is that there's three kinds of layer operations going on. There's ones, and here I'm expanding this now, we've got predicting a fourth character of a sequence using characters one, two, and three, using exactly the same method as on the previous slide. There are layer operations that turn a character input into a hidden um, activation, activation matrix. Here's one here, here's one here. There are layer operations that turn um, one hidden layer activations into a new hidden layer activations. And then there's an um, operation that takes hidden activations and turns it into output activations. And so you can see here I've colored them in, and here I've got a little legend of these different colors. Green are the input to hidden, blue is the hidden to output, and orange is the hidden to hidden. So my claim is that uh, there's a couple of things to note. The first is that the dimensions of the weight matrices for each of these different colored arrows, all of the green ones have the same dimensions because they're taking an input of vocab size and turning it into an output uh, hidden activations of size number of activations. So all of these arrows represent weight matrices which are of the same dimensionality. Ditto the orange arrows represent weight matrices of the same dimensionality. I would go further than that though and say the green arrows represent semantically the same thing. They're all saying how do you take a character and convert it into hidden state? And the orange arrows are all saying how do you take hidden state from a previous character and turn it into hidden state for a new character. And then the blue one is saying, how do you take hidden state and turn it into outputs? When you look at it that way, 
All of these circles are basically the same thing. They're just representing this hidden state at a different point in time. And I'm going to use this word time in a fairly general way. I'm not really talking about time, I'm just talking about the sequence in which we're presenting additional pieces of information to this um, model. We first of all present the first character, then the second character, and then the third character. So we could redraw this whole thing in a simpler way and a more general way. Before we do, I'm actually going to show you in Keras how to build this model. Right? And in doing so, we're going to learn a bit more about the functional API, which hopefully you'll find pretty interesting and useful. Um, to do that, we are going to use this corpus of uh, all of the collected works, works of Nietzsche. Um, so we load in um, those works, um, we find all of the unique characters, of which there are 86. Uh, here they are, joined up together. And then we create a mapping from the character to the index at which it appears in this list, and a mapping from the index to the character. So this is basically creating the equivalent of these tables. Or more specifically, I guess, this table. But rather than using words, we're looking at characters. So that allows us to take the text of uh, Nietzsche and convert it into a list of numbers, where the numbers represent the, num the, the uh, number at which the character appears in this list. So here are the first ten. So at any point we can turn this, that's called IDX. Okay, so we've converted our whole text into the equivalent indices. Um, at any point we can turn it back into text by simply taking those indexes and looking them up in our index to character mapping. Um, and so here you can see we've turned it back into the start of the text again. Okay, so that's the data we're working with. The data we're working with is a list of character IDs of this form, where those character IDs represent <laughs> the collected works of Nietzsche. So we're going to build a model which attempts to, I said word, it's not word, it's characters, which attempts to predict the fourth character from the previous three. Right? So to do that, we're going to go through our whole list of indexes, um, from naught up to the end, minus three, and we're going to create a whole list of the zeroth, third, um, sorry, the zeroth, fourth, eighth, twelfth, etc. characters, and a list of the first, fifth, ninth, etc., and the second, sixth, tenth, and so forth. Um, so this is going to represent the first character of each sequence, the second character of each sequence, the third character of each sequence, and this is the one we want to predict, the fourth character of each sequence. So we can now turn these into um, NumPy arrays just by stacking them up together. And so now we've got our um, input for our first characters, second characters, and third characters of every four-character piece of this um, collected works. And then our Ys, our labels, will simply be the fourth characters of each sequence. So here you can see them. Um, so for example, um, if we took x1, x2, and x3, and took the first element of each, this is the first character of the um, text, the second character of the text, the third character of the text, and the fourth character of the text. So we'll be trying to predict this based on these three. And then we'll try to predict this based on these three. Okay. So that's, that's our data format. Uh, so you can see we've got about uh, 200,000. Uh, of these uh, um, uh, inputs for each of x1 through x3 and for y. And so as per usual, we're going to first of all turn them into embeddings by creating an embedding matrix. I will mention this is not normal. Um, I, I, I haven't actually seen anybody else do this. Um, most people just treat them as one-hot encodings. Um, so for example, the most uh, uh, um, widely used uh, blog post about car RNNs, which kind of really made them popular, was Andre Kapathy's. It was quite fantastic. Um, and you can see that in his uh, version, he 
shows them as being oops. he shows them as being one hot encoded. Um, we're not going to do that. Um, we're going to turn them into embeddings. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense, you know, like capital A and lowercase a have some similarities that an embedding can understand. Um, different types of uh, things that have to be opened and closed, like different types of parentheses and quotes, have certain characteristics could, that can be constructed in embedding. There's all kinds of things that you know we would expect an embedding to capture. So my hypothesis uh, was that an embedding uh, is going to do a, um, a better job um, than that an embedding is going to do a better job than just a one-hot encoding. Um, and in my experiments over the last couple of weeks, that um, generally seems to be true. So we're going to take uh, each character, uh, one through three, and turn them into embeddings by first of all creating an input layer for them, and then creating an embedding layer for that input. Um, and then we return the input layer and the flattened version of the embedding layer. Okay. So this is the input to and output of each of our three embedding layers for our three input characters. So that's basically our inputs. So we now have to decide um, in our we now have to decide how many uh, activations do we want. Um, and so that's something we can just pick. Um, so I've decided to go with 256. Um, that's uh, something that seemed reasonable, seems to have worked okay. So, we now have to somehow construct something where um, each of our green arrows ends up with the same weight matrix. And it turns out Keras makes this really easy with the Keras functional API. When you call dense like this, um, what it's actually doing is it's creating a layer with a specific weight matrix. Notice that I haven't passed in anything here to say what um, it's connected to, so it's not part of a model yet. This is just saying I'm going to have something which is something which is a dense layer which creates 256 activations, and I'm going to call it dense in. So it doesn't actually do anything until I then do this, so I connect it to something. So here I'm going to say Character 1's hidden state comes from taking character number 1, which was the output of our first embedding, and putting it through this dense in layer. So this is the thing which creates our first circle. So the embedding was the thing that creates the output of our first rectangle. This creates our first circle. And so dense in is the green arrow. So what that means is that we now, in order to create the next set of activations, we need to create the orange arrow. So since the orange arrow is different weight matrix to the green arrow, we have to create a new dense layer. So here it is. I create a new dense layer, and again, with n hidden, hidden outputs. So by creating a new dense layer, this is a whole separate weight matrix this is going to keep track of. So now that I've done that, I can create my character 2 hidden state, which is here, and I'm going to have to sum up two separate things. I'm going to take the my character 2 embedding, put it through my green arrow, dense in, that's going to be there. I'm going to take the output of my character 1's hidden state and run it through my orange arrow, which we call dense hidden. We'll put that here. And then we're going to merge the two together. And merge, by default, does a sum. Okay, so this is adding together these two outputs. In other words, it's adding together these two layer operation outputs. And that gives us this circle. So the third character output is done in exactly the same way. We take the third character's embedding, run it through our green arrow, take the result of our previous hidden activations and run it through our orange arrow, and then merge the two together. Is the first output the size of the latent fields in the embedding? The size of the latent uh, the size of the latent embeddings we defined when we created the embeddings up here. 
um, and we define them as having uh, n fat size, and n fat we defined as 42. Right? So C1, C2, and C3 represent the result of putting each character through this embedding and getting out 42 latent factors. Those are then the things that we put into our green arrow. So after doing this three times, we now have C3 hidden, which is one, two, three, here. So we now need a new set of weights. We need another dense layer, the blue arrow. So we'll call that dense out. And this needs to create an output of size 86, vocab size. We need to create a, something which can match to the one hot encoded um, list of possible characters, which is 86 long. So now that we've got this orange arrow, we can apply that to our final hidden state to get our output. So in Keras, all we need to do now is call model passing in the three inputs, and so the three inputs were returned to us way back here. Each time we create an embedding, we returned the input layer. So C1 in, C2 in, C3 in. So passing in the three inputs and passing in our output. So that's our model. And so we can now compile it, set a learning rate, fit it, and as you can see, its loss is gradually decreasing. Uh, and we can then test that out uh, very easily by creating a little function that we're going to pass three letters. We're going to take those three letters and turn them into character indices. So turn just look them up to find the indexes. Turn each of those into a NumPy array. Call model.predict on those um, three arrays. Um, that gives us uh, 86 outputs for each uh, 86 outputs, which we then do argmax to find which one of those 86, which index into those 86 is the highest, and that's the character number that we want to return. So if we pass in PHI, it thinks that L is most likely next. Space TH, it thinks E is most likely next. Space AN, it thinks that D is most likely next. So you can see that it seems to be doing a pretty reasonable job of taking three characters and returning a fourth character that seems pretty sensible. Not the world's most powerful model, but um, a good example of how we can construct um, kind of pretty arbitrary architectures using Keras and then letting SGD do the work. Question on uh, this model, how, how would it consider the context in which we are trying to you know, predict the next? Uh, it knows nothing about the context. All it has at any point in time is the previous three characters. So it's not a great model. We're going to improve it though. We've got to start somewhere. Okay. Uh, at a later stage where we actually be doing the doing the predictions on real data, how would the context factor? We're getting there. Okay. So in order to answer your question, let's build this up a little further. And rather than trying to predict character 4 from the previous three characters, let's try and predict character n from the previous n minus 1 characters. And since all of these circles basically mean the same thing, which is the hidden state at this point, and since all of these orange arrows are literally the same thing, it's a dense layer with exactly the same weight matrix, let's stick all of the circles on top of each other, which means that these orange arrows then can just become one arrow pointing into itself. And this is the definition of a recurrent neural network. When we see it in this form, we say that we're looking at it in its recurrent form. When we see it in this form, we can say that we're looking at it in its unrolled form, or unfolded form. They're both very common. Um, this is obviously neater, right? Um, and so for quickly sketching out an RNN architecture, this is much more convenient. But actually, this unrolled form is really important. For example, when Keras uses TensorFlow as a backend, it actually always unrolls it in this way in order to compute it. That obviously takes up a lot more memory. Um, and so it's quite nice being able to use the Theano backend with Keras, which can actually directly implement it 
as this kind of loop. Um, and that's what we'll be doing today, um, shortly. Um, but in general, we've got the same idea. We're going to have character one input come in, uh, go through the first um, green arrow, uh, go through the first orange arrow, and then from then on we can just say take the second character, repeat, third character, repeat, and at each time period we're getting a new character going through a layer operation, as well as taking the previous hidden state and putting it through its layer operation. And then at the very end, we will put it through a different layer operation, the blue arrow, to get our output. So I'm going to show you this in Keras now. Does every fully connected layer have to have the same activation function? Um, in in general, um, no. Um, uh, in a uh, in all of the models we've seen so far. Um, we have constructed them in a way where you can write anything you like as the activation function. Um, in general, though, um, I haven't seen any examples of successful architectures which mix activation functions, other than, of course, that the output layer would pretty much always be a softmax, the classification. Um, I'm not sure it's not something that might become a good idea. Um, it's just not something that anybody's done anything very successfully with so far. <clears throat> I will mention something important about activation functions though, which is that um, you can use pretty much almost any, any nonlinear function as an activation function and get pretty reasonable results. There are actually some papers, some pretty cool papers people have written where they've tried all kinds of weird activation functions and they pretty much all work. Um, so it's not something to get hung up about. Um, it's more just certain activation functions um, will train more quickly <coughs> And more resiliently, um, and in particular, um, ReLU and ReLU variations uh, tend to work particularly well. Okay, so let's um, let's implement this. So we're going to use a very similar approach to what we used before, um, and we're going to create our first RNN, and we're going to create it from scratch um, using nothing but standard Keras dense layers. In this case, the inputs um, will not be, we can't create C1, C2, and C3. We're going to have to create an array of our inputs. We're going to have to decide what n are we going to use. And so for this one, I've decided to use 8. So CS is characters. So I'm going to use 8 characters to predict the ninth character. Um, so I'm going to create an array with 8 elements in it. And each element will contain a list of the 0, 8, 16, 24th character, the 1, 9, 17, etc. character, the 2, 10, 18, etc. character, just like before. Okay, so we're going to have um, a sequence of um, inputs where each one is, a, um, is offset by one from the previous one. And then our output will be exactly the same thing, um, except we're going to look at the um, indexed across by CS, so 8. So this will be the 8th thing in each sequence, and we're going to predict it with the previous ones. Um, so now we can go through every one of those input data items, uh, lists, and turn them into a NumPy array. And so here you can see that we have um, uh, 8 uh, inputs, um, and each one is of length 75,000 or so. Um, do the same thing for our y, create a numpy, numpy array out of it, and here we can visualize it. So here are the first eight um, elements of x. So this, um, so the, in looking at the first eight elements of x, let's look at the very first element of each one, 40, 42, 29. So this column is the first eight characters of our text. And here is the ninth character. So the first thing that the model will try to do is to look at these eight to predict this, and then it'll look at these eight to predict this, and look at these eight and predict this, and so forth. And indeed, you can see that this list here is exactly the same as this list here. Um, the final character of each sequence is the same as the first character of the next sequence. Okay. So it's almost exactly the same as our previous data. 
We've just done it in a more flexible way. Um, we'll create 42 latent factors as before. Um, where we use exactly the same um, embedding input function as before. Um, and again, we're just going to have to use um, um, lists to store everything. So in this case, all of our embeddings are going to be in a list. So we'll go through each of our um, characters and create an embedding input and output for each one. We'll store it here. Um, and here we have, we're going to define them all at once. Our green arrow, orange arrow, and blue arrow. Okay, so here we're basically saying we've got three different weight matrices that we want Keras to keep track of for us. So the very first hidden state here is going to take the um, list of all of our inputs. We're going to take the first one of those, and then that's a tuple of two things. The first is the input to it, and the second is the output of the embedding. So we're going to take the output of the embedding for the very first character, pass that into our green arrow, and that's going to give us our initial hidden state. And then this looks exactly the same as we saw before, but rather than doing it listing separately, we're just going to loop through all of our remaining one through eight characters, and go ahead and create the green arrow, orange arrow, and add the two together. So finally, we can take that final hidden state, put it through our blue arrow, to create our final output. So we can then tell Keras that our model is all of the embedding inputs for that list we created together, and that's our inputs, and then our output that we just created is the output. And we can go ahead and fit that model. So we would expect this to be um, more accurate because it's now got eight pieces of context in order to predict. So previously we were getting this is about two. Hopefully this is going to be better. Yeah, this time we get down to 1.8. Okay, so it's still not great, um, but it's an improvement, and we can create exactly the same kind of tests as before. So now we can pass in eight characters and get a prediction of the ninth. And these all look pretty reasonable. So that is our first RNN that we've now built from scratch. This kind of RNN, where we're taking a list and predicting a single thing um, is most likely to be useful for things like um, sentiment analysis. Remember our sentiment analysis example using IMDB? Right? So in this case we were taking a sequence, being a, a list of words in a sentence, and predicting whether or not something is positive sentiment or negative sentiment. So that would seem like an um, appropriate kind of use case for this style of RNN. So at that moment, my computer crashed, and uh, we lost a little bit of the class's video. So uh, I'm just going to fill in the bit that we missed here. So sorry for the slight discontinuity. Um, so I wanted to show you something kind of interesting, which you may have noticed, which is when we created our um, hidden, uh, our hidden dense layer. Um, that is our orange arrow. Uh, I did not initialize it in the default way, which is the Gloro initialization, but instead I said init equals identity. Um, you may also have noticed that the equivalent thing was shown in our Keras RNN. This here where it says inner init equals identity was referring to the same thing. It's referring to what is the initialization that is used for this orange arrow. How are those weights originally initialized? So rather than initializing them randomly, we're going to initialize them with an identity matrix. An identity matrix, you may recall from your linear algebra at school, is a matrix which is all zeros, except it is just ones down the diagonal. So if you multiply any matrix by the identity matrix, it doesn't change the original matrix at all. You get back exactly what you started with. So in other words, we're going to start off by initializing our orange arrow, not with a random matrix, but with a matrix that causes the hidden state to not change at all. 
Um, that makes some intuitive sense. Um, it seems reasonable to say, well, in the absence of other knowledge to the contrary, why don't we start off by having the hidden state stay the same until the SGD has a chance to update that. But it actually turns out that uh, it also makes sense based on an empirical analysis. Uh, so since we always only do things that Jeffrey Hinton tells us to do, um, that's good news because this is a paper by Jeff Hinton in which he points out um, this rather neat trick, which is if you initialize an RNN with the um, hidden uh, weight matrix initialized to an identity matrix and use rectified linear units um, as uh, we are here, um, you actually get uh, an architecture which can get um, fantastic results on some reasonably significant um, problems, including speech recognition and language modeling. Um, I don't see this paper referred to or discussed very often, um, even though it is well over a year old now. Um, so I'm not sure if people forgot about it or haven't noticed it or, or what, but this is actually a good trick to remember. Um, is that you can often get quite a long way um, doing nothing but an identity matrix initialization and rectified linear units in just as we have done here to set up our architecture. Okay, so that's a nice little trick to remember. Um, and so the next thing we're going to do is to make a couple of minor changes to this diagram. So the first change we're going to make is we're going to take this, this rectangle here. So this rectangle is referring to what is it that we repeat. And so since in this case we're predicting character n from characters 1 through n minus 1, then this whole area here we're looping for, um, from 2 to n minus 1 before we generate our output once at the end. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this triangle and we're going to put it inside the loop, put it inside the rectangle. And so what that means is that every time we loop through this, we're going to generate another output. So rather than generating one output at the end, this is going to predict characters 2 through n using characters n 1 through n minus 1. So it's going to predict character 2 using character 1, and character 3 using characters 1 and 2 and character 4 using characters 1, 2, and 3, and so forth. And so that's what this model would do. It's nearly exactly the same as the previous model, except after every single step, after creating the hidden state on every step, we're going to create an output every time. So this is not going to create a single output like this does, which pr predicted a single character, the last character, or in fact the next after the last character of the sequence, character n, using characters 1 through n minus 1. This is going to predict a whole sequence of characters 2 through n using characters 1 through n minus 1. Okay, so that was all the stuff that we lost when we uh, had our computer crash. So let's now go back to the lesson. Let's now talk about how we would implement this sequence where we're going to predict characters 2 through n using characters 1 through n minus 1. Now why would this be a good idea? Um, there's a few reasons, but one obvious reason why this would be a good idea is that if we're only predicting one output for every n inputs, then the number of times that our model has the opportunity to back propagate those in great gradients and improve those weights is just once for each sequence of characters. Whereas if we predict characters 2 through n using characters 1 through n minus 1, we're actually getting a whole lot of feedback about how our model's going. So we can back propagate n times, or actually n minus 1 times, um, uh, every time we do another sequence. So there's a lot more learning going on for the same amount, or nearly the same amount, of computation. Um, the other reason this is handy is that, as you'll see in a moment, it's very helpful for creating RNNs which can do uh, truly long-term dependencies, or um, context, as one of the uh, people asking a question earlier described it. So we're going to start here before we look at how to do context. And so 
really anytime you're doing a kind of sequence to sequence exercise you probably want to construct something of this format where your triangle is inside the square rather than outside the square it's going to look very very similar um, and so I'm calling this returning sequences so rather than returning a single character we're going to return a sequence and really um, there's, most things are the same our um, character in data is identical to before so I've just commented it out and now our character out our output isn't just a single character but it's actually a list of eight sequences again it's in fact it's exactly the same as the input except that I have removed the minus one so it's just shifted over by one so my in each sequence the first character will be used to predict the second the first and second will predict the third the first second and third will predict the fourth and so forth so we've got a lot more predictions going on and therefore a lot more opportunity for the model to learn um, so then we will um, uh, create our y's just as before with our x's um, and so now our y uh, data set looks exactly like our x data set did but everything's just shifted across by one character and the model's going to look almost identical as well um, we've got our three dense layers as before um, but we're going to do one other thing different to before rather than treating the first character as special I won't treat it as special I'm going to move the character into here so that rather than repeating from 2 to n minus 1 I'm going to repeat from 1 to n minus 1 so I've moved my first character into here so the only thing I have to be careful of is that we have to somehow initialize our hidden state to something so we're going to initialize our hidden state to a vector of zeros so here we do that we say okay we're going to have to have something to initialize our hidden state which we're going to feed it with a vector of zeros shortly so our initial hidden state is just going to be the result of that and then our loop is identical to before but at the end of every loop we're going to append this output so we're now going to have eight outputs for every sequence rather than one and so now our model has two changes the first is it's got an array of outputs and the second is that we have to add the thing that we're going to use to store our um, vector of zeros uh, somewhere and so we're going to put this into our input as well back on the diagram could you say what the box means again the box refers to the um, the area that we're looping so um, initially we repeated the character n input coming into here and then the hidden state going back to itself from 2 to n minus 1 so the box is the thing which I'm looping through all those times and this time I'm looping through this whole thing so character input coming in generating the hidden state and creating an output repeating that whole thing every time and so now you can see creating the output is inside the loop rather than outside the loop so therefore we end up with an array of outputs so that's so our model's nearly exactly the same as before it's just got these two changes so now when we fit our model we're going to add a array of zeros to the start of our inputs um, our outputs are going to be those lists of eight that have been offset by one uh, and we can go ahead and train this and you can see that as we train it you can see that as we train it now we don't just have one loss we have eight losses and that's because every one of those eight outputs has its own loss how are we going at predicting character one in each sequence two three four and as you would expect our ability to predict the first character using nothing but a vector of zeros is pretty limited so that very quickly flattens out uh, whereas our ability to predict the eighth character well it has a lot more context right it has eight char seven characters of context and so you can see that the eighth character's loss keeps on improving and indeed by by a few epochs we have a significantly better loss than we did before so this is what a sequence model looks like and so you can see a sequence model when we test it we pass in a sequence like this 
space this is. And after every character, it returns its guess. So after seeing a space, it guesses the next will be a T. After seeing a space T, it guesses the next will be an H. After seeing space TH, it guesses the next will be an E, and so forth. Okay, and so you can see that it's you know predicting some pretty um, reasonable things here, and indeed quite often there, what actually happened. So it sees after seeing space P A R T, it expects that will be the end of the word, and indeed it was. And after seeing part, it's guessing that the next word is going to be of, and indeed it was. Okay, so it's able to um, use sequences of eight to create context, um, which isn't brilliant, but it's uh, it's an improvement. So how do we do that same thing with Keras? Um, with Keras, um, it's identical to our previous model, except that we have to use the different uh, input and output arrays, just like I just showed you, so the, the whole sequence of labels and the whole sequence of inputs. And then the second thing we have to do is add one parameter, which is return sequences equals true. Return sequences equals true simply says, rather than putting the triangle outside the loop, put the triangle inside the loop. And so return an output from every time you go to another time step, rather than just returning a single output at the end. So it's that easy in Keras. I add this return sequences equals true. Um, I don't have to change my data um, at all, other than some um, very minor uh, dimensionality changes, uh, and then I can just fit, go ahead and fit it. As you can see, I get a pretty similar uh, loss function to what I did before, and I can um, build something that looks very much like we had before and generate some pretty similar results. Okay, so that's how we create a sequence model with um, Keras. Um, okay. So then the question of, well, how do you create more state? Um, how do you generate a model which is able to handle long-term dependencies? To generate a model that um, understands long-term dependencies, we can't anymore present um, our pieces of data at random. So, so far we've always been using the default um, when we do fit model, which is shuffle equals true. So it's passing across these sequences of eight in a random order. If we're going to do something which understands long-term dependencies, the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to use shuffle equals false. The second thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to stop passing in an array of zeros as my starting point every time around. So effectively, what I want to do is I want to pass in my array of zeros right at the very start, when I first start training, but then at the end of my sequence of eight, rather than going back to initialize to zeros, I actually want to keep this hidden state. Right? And then, so then I'd start my next sequence of eight with this hidden state exactly where it was before. And that's going to allow it to basically build up arbitrarily long dependencies. So in Keras, um, that's actually as simple as um, adding one additional parameter. And the additional parameter is called stateful. And so when you say stateful equals true, what that tells Keras is that at the end of each sequence, don't reset the hidden activations to zero, but leave them as they are. And that means that we have to make sure we pass shuffle equals false when we train it. So it's now going to pass the first eight characters of the book, and then the second eight characters of the book, and then the third eight characters of the book, leaving the hidden um, state untouched between each one, and therefore it's allowing it to continue to build up as much state as it wants to. Um, training these stateful models is a lot harder than training the models that we've seen so far. And the reason is this. Um, in these stateful models, this orange arrow, this, this single weight matrix, it's being applied to this hidden matrix not eight times, but a hundred thousand times. 
or more, depending on how big your text is. And just imagine if this um, weight matrix was even slightly poorly scaled, so if there was like one number in it which was just a bit too high, then effectively that number is going to be to the power of a hundred thousand. Right? It's being multiplied again and again and again. So what can happen is you get this problem they call um, exploding gradients, or really in some ways it's better described as exploding activations. Um, because we're multiplying this by this almost the same weight matrix each time, if that weight matrix is anything less than perfectly scaled, then it's going to make our hidden matrix disappear off into infinity. And so we have to be very careful of how to train these. And indeed, these kinds of long-term dependency models were um, thought of as impossible to train for a while, um, until some um, folks in the um, when was it? Mid 90s, I guess, came up with a model called the LSTM, or Long Short Term Memory. And in the long short term memory, and we'll learn more about it next week, and we're actually going to implement it ourselves from scratch, we replace this loop here with a loop where there is actually a neural network inside the loop that decides how much of this state matrix to keep and how much to use. At each activation. And so by having a neural network which actually controls how much state is kept and how much is used, it can actually learn how to avoid those, um, those gradient explosions. It can actually learn how to create an, kind of an effective sequence. So we're going to look at that a lot more um, next week, but for now I will tell you that when I tried to run this using a simple RNN, even with an identity matrix, um, initialization and ReLUs, um, I had no luck at all. Um, so I had to replace it with an LSTM. Even that wasn't enough. Um, I had to have well-scaled inputs, so I added a batch normalization layer after my embeddings. And after I did those things, then I could fit it. Um, it still ran pretty slowly, so before I was getting 4 seconds per epoch, now it's 13 seconds per epoch, and the reason here is it's much harder to parallelize this. It has to do each sequence in order, you know, um, so it's going to be slower. Um, but over time, um, it does eventually get um, substantially better loss than I had before, and that's because it's able to keep track of and use this state. Doesn't it make sense to use batch norm in the loop as well? Um, that's a good question. Um, um, definitely, maybe. Um, there's been a lot of discussion and papers about this recently. Um, there's uh, something called layer normalization, which is a method which is explicitly designed to work well with RNNs. Um, standard batch norm doesn't. Um, it turns out it's actually very easy to do layer normalization with Keras using a simple couple of simple parameters that you can provide to the normal batch norm constructor. Um, in my experiments, um, that hasn't worked so well, um, and uh, I will show you uh, a, um, a lot more about that in just a few minutes. Okay, so um, stateful models uh, are great. We're going to look at um, some very successful st stateful models in just a moment, um, but just be aware that they are um, more challenging to train. You'll see another thing I had to do here is I had to reduce the learning rate in the middle, um, uh, again, because you just have to be so careful of these kind of exploding gradient problems. Uh, okay, so let me show you what I did with this, which is I tried to um, create a stateful model which worked as well as I could. Um, so I took the same um, Nietzsche data as before, um, and I tried splitting it into chunks of 40 rather than 8, so each one could do more work. Um, uh, so here are some examples of those chunks of um, 40. Um, and I built a model that was slightly more sophisticated than the previous one in two ways. The first is, um, it has an RNN feeding into an RNN. Um, that's kind of a crazy idea, so I've drawn a picture. Um, so an RNN feeding into an RNN means that the output 
is no longer going to an output. It's actually the output of the first RNN is becoming the input to the second RNN. Right? So the character input goes into our first RNN and has the state updates as per usual. And then each time we go through the sequence, it feeds the result to the state of the second RNN. Why is this useful? Well, because it means that this output is now coming from not just a single um, dense matrix with a um, uh, and then a single dense matrix here. It's actually going through one, two, three. Uh, dense matrices and activation functions. So I now have a deep neural network, assuming that two layers gets to count as deep, um, between my first character and my first output. And then indeed between every hidden state and every output, I now have multiple hidden layers. So effectively what this is allowing us to do is to create a little deep neural net uh, for all of our um, activations. and. That turns out to work really well, um, because the structure of language is um, pretty complex, and so it's nice to be able to give it a more um, flexible function that it can learn. Um, so that's the first thing I do, and it's it's this easy to create that. You just copy and paste your whatever your RNN line is twice. Uh, you can see I've now added dropout inside my RNN. And as I talked about before, adding dropout inside your RNN um, turns out to be a really good idea, and there's a really great paper about that quite recently showing um, that this is a, a, a great way to um, regularize an RNN. And then the second change I made is rather than going straight from the um, RNN to our output, um, I went through a dense layer. Now. There's something that you might have noticed here is that our dense layers have this extra word at the front. Um, why do they have this extra word at the front? Time distributed. Um, it might be easier to understand why by looking at this earlier sequence model with Keras. And note that the output of our RNN is not just a vector of length 256, but 8 vectors of length 256, because it's actually predicting eight outputs. So we can't just have a normal dense layer, because a normal dense layer is, it needs a, um, um, a, single, uh, a single dimension that it can squish down. Um, so in this case, what we actually want to do is we want to create eight separate dense layers at the output, one for every one of the outputs. And so what time distributed does is it says whatever the layer is in the middle, I want you to create eight copies of them, or however many, however long this dimension is. And every one of those copies is going to share the same weight matrix, which is exactly what we want. Right? So the short version here is, in Keras, any time you say return sequences equals true, um, any dense layers you have after that will always have to have time distributed wrapped around them, because we want to create not just one dense layer, but eight dense layers. So in this case, since we are saying return sequences equals true, we then have a time distributed dense layer, some dropout, and another time distributed dense layer. Great, a few questions. Um, does the first RNN complete before it passes to the second, or is it layer by layer? No, it's 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 just a um, it's just it's operating exactly like this. So my initialization starts, my first character comes in, um, and at the output of that comes two things, the hidden state for my next hidden state and the output that goes into um, my second LST, LSTM. So everything is just pushed through. Um, if you try The best way to think of this actually would probably be to actually draw it in the unrolled form, okay? And um, then you'll realize there's nothing magical about this at all. It's actually, in an unrolled form, it just looks like a pretty standard um, deep neural net. What's dropout underscore u and dropout underscore w? Um, we'll talk about that um, more next week. Um, in an LSTM, I mentioned that there's kind of like little neural nets that control how the state updates work, and so this is talking about how the dropout works inside these like little neural nets. 
And when stateful is false, can you explain again what is reset after each training example? Sure. The best way to describe that is to show us doing it. So remember that the um, RNNs that we built are identical to what Keras does, or close enough to identical. So let's go and have a look at our version of return sequences. So you can see that what we did was we created a matrix of zeros that we stuck onto the front of our inputs. So every set of eight characters now starts with a vector of zeros. So in other words, this initialized to zeros happens every time we finish a sequence. So in other words, this hidden state gets initialized to zero at the end of every sequence. And it's this hidden state which is where all of these um, dependencies and state is, is kept. So doing that is resetting the state um, every time we look at a new sequence. So when we say state for equals false, it, it only does this initialize to zero step once um, at the very start, uh, or when we explicitly ask it to. And so when I actually um, run this model, the way I do it is I wrote a little thing called run epochs that goes model.reset states and then does a fit on one epoch, which is what you really want, right? At the end of your entire works of Nietzsche, you, you want to reset the state because you're about to go back to the very start and start again. So, um, so with uh, this multi-layer LSTM going into a multi-layer um, neural net, um, I then tried seeing how that goes. And remember that with our simpler um, versions, we were getting kind of 1.6 loss was the best we could do. Um, uh, after one epoch, uh, it's awful. And if I and now rather than just printing out one letter. I'm starting with a whole sequence of letters, which is that, and asking it to generate a sequence. And you can see it starts out by generating a pretty rubbishy sequence. Um, one more question. In the double LSTM layer model, what is the input to the second LSTM in addition to the output of the first LSTM? Um, in addition to the output of the first LSTM is the previous output of its own hidden state. Um, okay, so after a few more epochs, um, it's starting to create some um, actual proper English words, although the English words aren't make necessarily making a lot of sense. Um, so I keep running epochs. Um, at this point, it's learned how to start chapters. This is actually how, um, in this book, the chapters always start with a number and then an equal sign. Uh, it hasn't learned how to close quotes, apparently. Um, it's not really saying anything useful. Um, so anyway, I kind of ran this uh, overnight, um, and I then seeded it with a larger amount of data. So I seeded it with all this data, and I st started getting some pretty reasonable results. Um, shreds into one's own suffering sounds exactly like the kind of thing that you might see. Um, <laughs> religions have acts done by man. I mean, it's not all perfect, but it's not bad. Interestingly. This sequence here, when I, I looked it up, and it actually appears in his book. And this makes sense, right? Um, it's a kind of overfitting in a sense. Um, when, um, you know, he loves talking in all caps, right? But he only does it from time to time. And so once the, um, it, it so happened to start writing something in all caps that looked like this phrase that only appeared once and is very unique. There was kind of no other way that it could have finished it, right? So sometimes you get like these little rare phrases that basically it's plagiarized directly from Nietzsche. Now, um, I didn't stop there because I thought, how can we improve this? And it was at this point that I started thinking about batch normalization. And I started fid fiddling around with a lot of different types of batch normalization and layer normalization. And um, 
discovered this um, interesting um, uh, insight, which is that the at least in this case the very best approach was when I simply applied batch normalization to the embedding layer. So um, I want to show you what happened. When I applied batch normalization to the embedding layer, um, this is the training curve that I got. So over epochs, this is my loss. Um, with no batch normalization on the embedding layer, this was my loss. And so you can see this was actually starting to flatten out. This one really wasn't, and this one was training a lot quicker. So then I tried training it with batch norm um, on the embedding layer overnight, and I was pretty stunned by the results. Um, this was my seeding text, um, and after a thousand epochs, um, sorry, after yeah, a thousand epochs, um, this is what it came up with, and it's got all kinds of like. Actually pretty interesting little things. Perhaps some morality equals self-glorification. Uh, this is really cool. Um, for there are holy eyes to Schopenhauer's blind. This is like interesting. In reality we must step above it. You can see that it's learnt to close quotes even when those quotes were opened a long time ago. Right? So if we weren't using stateful it would never have learnt how to do this. Um, and so, and I've 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 looked up these words in the original text, and that these the, none of, pretty much none of these phrases appear. So this is actually a genuine novel, novelly produced um, piece of text. It's not, um, you know, it's not perfect by any means. But considering that this is only doing it character by character, using nothing but a forty-two long embedding matrix for each character. Um, and nothing but there's there's no pre-trained vectors or anything. There's just a pretty short, you know, six hundred thousand uh, character epoch. I think it's done a pretty amazing job um, of creating a, a a pretty good model. And so there's all kinds of things you could do with a model like this. I mean, the most obvious one would be if you were producing a you know a software keyboard for a mobile phone, for example, you could use this to have a pretty accurate guess as to what they were going to type next and correct it for them. Um, you could do some, something similar on a word basis. Um, but more generally, um, you could do something like a, um, anomaly detection with this. You could generate a sequence that uh, is predicting what the rest of the sequence is going to look like for the next hour, and then recognize if something kind of falls outside of what your prediction was, and then you know that there's been some kind of anomaly. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do with these kinds of um, with these kinds of models. I think that's pretty fun, um, but I want to show you something else which is pretty fun, which is to um, build an R and N um, from scratch in Theano. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and work up to next week, where we're going to build an R and N from scratch. In NumPy, um, and we're also going to build a um, an LSTM from scratch uh, in Theano. So um, we're going to try and and the reason we're doing this is because um, you know next week's our last class in in this part of the course. You know I, I want us to leave with kind of feeling like we really understand the details of what's going on behind the scenes. Like the main thing I wanted to teach in this class is the applied stuff. You know these kind of practical tips. About like how you build a sequence model, you know, use return equals true, put batch norm in the embedding layer, you know, um, add time distributed to the dense layer. But I also I know that to to kind of really debug your models and to build your architectures and stuff, you, it really helps to understand what's going on. Um, particularly, you know, in the current situation where the tools and libraries available are not that mature. Um, they still require a whole lot of um, kind of manual stuff. So I, I do want to try and explain a bit more about what's going on behind the scenes. So um, in order to build an RNN in Theano, I'm going to first of all uh, make a small change to our Keras model, which is that I'm going to use um, one hot encoding. So I don't know if you noticed this, but we did something pretty um, pretty cool in all of our models so far. Which is that we never actually um, one-hot encoded our output. 
will time distributed dents take longer to train than dents? And is it really that important to use time distributed dents? So if you don't add time distributed dents to a model where return sequence is equals true, it, it literally won't work. It won't compile because you're trying to predict eight things and the dense layer is going to stick that all into one thing. So it's going to say there's a mismatch in your, um, in your dimensions. Um, but no, it, it, it uh, doesn't really add much time um, because that's something that can be very easily parallelized. Um, and since like a lot of things in RNNs can't be easily parallelized, there generally is plenty of room in your GPU to do more work. So um, yeah, so that should be fine. There's no, but I mean the short answer is you have to use it, otherwise it won't work. Okay, um, I wanted to point out something, which is that in all of our models so far, we did not one hot encode our outputs. So our outputs, remember, looked like looked like this. They were sequences of numbers. And so um, always before we've had to one hot encode our outputs to use them. Um, th it turns out that Keras has a very cool loss function called sparse categorical cross entropy. And this is identical to categorical cross entropy, but rather than taking a one hot encoded um, target, it takes an integer target. And basically it, it acts as if you had one-hot encoded it. So it basically does the indexing into it directly. Um, so this is a really helpful thing to know about because when you have um, a lot of output categories, um, like for example if you're doing a word model, um, you could have a hundred thousand output categories. There's no way you want to create a matrix that is a hundred thousand long, nearly all zeros for every single word in your output. So by using sparse categorical cross entropy, you can just forget the whole one hot encoding. You just you don't have to do it. Uh, Keras implicitly does it for you, but without ever actually explicitly doing it, it just does a direct lookup into the matrix. Um, however, um, because I want to make things simpler for us to understand, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, recreate our Keras model using one hot encoding. Um, and so I'm going to take exactly the same model that we had before um, with return sequences equals true. Um, but this time I'm going to use normal categorical cross entropy, um, which means that, oh, and the other thing I'm doing is I don't have an embedding layer, right? So since I don't have an embedding layer, I also have to one hot encode my inputs. So you can see I'm calling two categorical on all of my inputs and two categorical on all of my outputs. Um, so now the shape is 75,000 by 8 as before by 86. So this is the one hot encoding dimension of which there are 85 zeros and one one. Um, so we fit this in exactly the same way. Um, we get exactly the same answer. Um, so the only reason I was doing that was because I want to um, use one hot encoding for the version that we're going to create uh, ourselves from scratch. Okay, so we haven't really looked at Theano before, um, but um, particularly if you come back next year, um, as we start to try to like, um, add more and more stuff on top of Keras uh, or into Keras, Increasingly, you'll find yourself wanting to use Theano because Theano is the language, if you like, that Keras um, is using behind the scenes, and therefore it's kind of the language which you can use to extend it. Um, of course, you can use TensorFlow as well, um, but we're using um, Theano in this course um, because I think it's much easier um, for this kind of um, application. So let's learn to use Theano. Um, and in the process of doing it in Theano, we're going to have to kind of force ourselves to think through a lot more of the details than we have before, because Theano, uh, because Theano doesn't have any of the conveniences that Keras has. There's no such thing as a layer. You know, um, we have to think about all of the weight matrices and activation functions and everything ourselves. So let me show you how it works. Um, 
In Theano, there's this concept of a, um, a variable. And a variable is something which we basically define like so. We can say there is a variable which is a matrix which I will call T input. And there is a variable which is a matrix that we'll call T output. And there is a variable that is a vector that we will call H0. Now what these are all saying is that these are um, things that we will give values to later. Um, Programming in Theano is very different to programming in normal Python, and the reason for this is Theano's kind of job in life is to provide a way for you to describe a computation that you want to do, and then it's going to compile it for the GPU, and then it's going to run it on the GPU. So it's going to be a little more complex to work in Theano, because Theano isn't going to be something where we immediately say do this and then do this and then do this. Instead we're going to build up what's called a computation graph. It's going to be a, a series of steps. We're going to say in the future I'm going to give you some data and when I do I want you to do these steps. Right? So rather than actually starting off by giving it data, we start off by just describing the types of data that when we do give it data we're going to give it. So eventually we're going to give it some input data. We're going to give it some output data, and we're going to give it some way of initializing the first hidden state. Oh, and also we'll give it a learning rate, because we might want to change it later. So that's all these things do. They create Theano variables. Right? So then we can create a list of those, and so this is all of the arguments that we're going to have to provide to Theano later on. So we haven't There's no data here, nothing's being computed, we're just telling Theano that these things are going to be used in the future. The next thing that we need to do is, because we're going to try to build, we're going to try to build this, right? is we're going to have to build all of the pieces in all of these layer operations. So specifically, we're going to have to create the weight vector and bias matrix for the orange arrow, the weight vector and the bias matrix for the green arrow, Uh, sorry, the weight matrix and the bias vector for the orange arrow, the weight matrix and the bias vector for the green arrow, and the weight matrix and the bias vector for the blue arrow. Because that's what these layer operations are. They're um, a matrix multiply followed by a nonlinear activation function. Um, so I've created some functions to do that. So WH is what I'm going to call the um, uh, weights and bias to my hidden layer. WX will be my weights and bias to my input and wy will be my weights and bias and my output. And so to create them, I've created this little function called weights and bias, in which I tell it um, the size of the matrix that I want to create. So the matrix that goes from input to hidden, therefore has n input rows and n hidden columns. So weights and bias is here, and it's going to return a tuple It's going to return our weights, and it's going to return our bias. Okay, so how do we create the weights? To create the weights, we first of all calculate the magic Glorow number, uh, square root of 2 over fan n. Um, so that's the scale of the random numbers that we're going to use. We then create those random numbers using the numpy normal random number function. And then we use a special Theano um, uh, keyword called shared. And what shared does is it says to Theano, this is um, this data is something that I'm going to want you to pass off to the GPU later and keep track of. So as soon as you wrap something in shared, it kind of belongs to Theano now. Okay. So here is a weight matrix that belongs to Theano. Here is a vector of zeros. That belongs to Theano, and that's our initial bias. Okay, so we've initialized our weights and our bias, and so we can do that for our inputs, and we can do that for our outputs, and then for our hidden, okay, which is the orange arrow. Remember, we're going to do something slightly different, which is we will initialize it using an identity matrix, and rather amusingly, in NumPy, it is I for identity. Okay, so this is an identity matrix, believe it or not, of size n by n. And so that's uh, our initial weights, 
and our initial bias is um, exactly as before. It's a vector of zeros. So you can see we've had to manually construct um, each of these three uh, weight matrices and bias vectors. Um, it's nice to now stick them all into a single list, um, and Python has this thing called chain from iterable, which basically takes all of these tuples and dumps them all together into a single list. And so this now has all six um, weight matrices and bias vectors in a single list. Okay, now we have defined the initial contents of each of these arrows, and we've also defined kind of symbolically um, the concept that we're going to have something to initialize it with here, something to initialize it with here, and some target to initialize it with here. So the next thing we have to do is to tell Theano what happens each time we take a single step of this um, RNA. On the GPU, you can't use a for loop. And the reason you can't use a for loop is because a GPU wants to be able to parallelize things, it wants to do things at the same time. And a for loop, by definition, can't do the second part of the loop until it's done the first part of the loop. Um, I don't know if we'll get time to do it in this course or not, um, but there's a very neat result which shows that there's something very similar to a for loop that you can parallelize, and it's called a scan operation. A scan operation um, is uh, something that's defined in a very particular way. A scan operation is something where you um, call some function for every element of some sequence. And at every point, the function returns some output, and the next time through that function is called, it's going to get the output of the previous time you called it, along with the next element of the sequence. So in fact, I've got an example of it. Um, I actually wrote a very simple example of it in Python, which I think is here. Here is the definition of scan, and here is an example of scan. Let's start with the example. I want to do a scan, and the function I'm going to use is to add two things together. And I am going to start off with the number 0, and then I'm going to pass in a range of numbers from 0 to 4. Okay, so what scan does is it starts out by taking the first time through, it's going to call this function with that argument, and the first element of this. So it's going to be 0 plus 0 equals 0. The second time, it's going to call this function with the second element of this, along with the result of the previous call. So it'll be 0 plus 1 equals 1. The next time through, it's going to call this function with the result of the previous call, plus the next element of this range. So it'll be 1 plus 2 equals 3. So you can see here, this scan operation defines a cumulative sum. And so you can see the definition of scan here. We're going to be returning an array of results. Initially, we take our starting point, 0, and that's our initial value for previous, uh, previous answer from scan. And then we're going to go through everything in the sequence, which is not through 4. We're going to apply this function, which in this case was add things up. And we're going to apply it to the previous result along with the next element of the sequence. Stick the result at the end of our list, set the previous result to whatever we just got, and then go back to the next element of the sequence. So it may be very surprising, I mean hopefully it is very surprising because it's an extraordinary result, but this it is possible to write a parallel version of this. Right? So if you can turn your algorithm into a scan, you can run it quickly on a GPU. So what we're going to do is, our job is to turn the um, this RNN into something that we can put into this kind of format, into a scan. So let's do that. Okay. So the function that we're going to call on each step through is the function called step. 
and the function called step is going to be something which hopefully will not be very surprising to you. It's going to be something which takes our input x, it does a dot product by that weight matrix we created earlier, wx, and adds on that bias vector we created earlier. And then we do the same thing, taking our previous hidden state, multiplying it by the weight matrix for the hidden state, and adding the biases for the hidden state, and then puts the whole thing through an activation function, ReLU. So in other words, that was calculating these... Uh, in fact, let's go back to the unrolled version. So we had one bit which was calculating our previous hidden state and putting it through the hidden state weight, um, uh, weight matrix, which is an orange arrow. It was taking our next input and putting it through the input um, one and then adding the two together. Okay, so that's what we have here. The x by wx and the h by wh, and then adding the two together along with the biases, and then put that through an activation function. So once we've done that, we now want to create an output every single time, right? And so our output is going to be exactly the same thing. It's going to take the result of that, which we called h, our hidden state, multiply it by the output's weight vector, adding on the bias, and this time we're going to use softmax. Right? So you can see that this sequence here is describing how to do one of these things. Okay, and so this therefore defines what we want to do each step through and at the end of that we're going to return the hidden state we have so far and our output. So that's what's going to happen each step. Um, so the sequence that we're going to pass, it, uh, pass into it is, well, we're not going to give it any data yet, because remember all we're doing is we're describing a computation. So for now, we're just telling it that it's going to be, it will be a matrix, right? So we're saying it will be a, ma a matrix, we're going to pass you a matrix. Um, it also needs a starting point, and so the starting point is, again, we're going to, we are going to provide to you an initial value for our hidden state, um, but we haven't done it yet. And then finally, in Theano, you have to tell it what are all of the other things that are passed to the function, and we're going to pass it that whole list of weights. So that's why we have here the x, the hidden, and then all of whoops, Daisy, and then all of the weights and biases. So that's now described how to execute um, uh, a whole sequence of steps for an RNN. So we've now described how to do this to Theano. We haven't given it any data to do it, we've just set up the computation. And so when that computation is run, it's going to return two things, because step returned two things. It's going to return the hidden state, and it's going to return our output activations. So now we need to calculate our error. So our error will be the categorical cross-entropy, and so these things are all part of Theano. You can see I'm using some Theano functions here. And so we're going to compare the output that came out of our scan, and we're going to compare it to what? We don't know yet, but it will be a matrix. Okay? And then once you do that, add it all together. Now here's the amazing thing. Every step we're going to want to apply SGD, which means every step we're going to want to take the derivative of this whole thing with respect to all of the weights and use that along with the learning rate to update all of the weights. In Theano, that's how you do it. You just say, please tell me the gradient of this function with respect to these inputs. And Theano will symbolically, automatically calculate all of the derivatives for you. Um, so that's very nearly magic. Um, but we don't have to worry about derivatives, um, because it's going to calculate them all for us. So at this point I now have a function that calculates our loss, and I have a function that calculates all of the gradients that we need with respect to all of the different weights, parameters that we have. So we're now ready to um, build our final function. And so our final function as input takes 
all of our arguments that is these four things which is the things we told it we're going to need later the thing that it's going to create as an output is the error which was this output and then at each step it's going to do some updates and so it's going to update so what are the updates it's going to do the updates it's going to do is the result of this little function and this little function is something that creates a dictionary that is going to map every one of our weights to that weight minus each one of our gradients times the learning rate so it's going to update every weight to itself minus its gradient times the learning rate so basically what Theano does is it says it's got this little thing called updates it says every time you calculate the next step I want you to change your shared variables as follows and so there's our list of changes to make um, and so that's it uh, so we use our one hot encoded X's and our one hot encoded Y's And we have to now manually create our own loop, right? The Arno doesn't have any built-in stuff for us, so we're going to go through every element of our um, input, and we're going to say, okay, let's call that function. So that function is the function that we just created, and now we have to pass in all of these inputs. So we have to finally pass in a value for the initial hidden state, the input, the target. And the learning rate, and so this is where we get to do it is when we finally call it here. So here's our initial hidden state, it's just a bunch of zeros, our input, our output, and our learning rate, which we set to 0.01. And then I've just said something here that says, okay, every thousand times um, print out the error. And so as you can see, over time it learns. And so at the end of learning. Um, I create a new Theano function which takes some piece of input along with some initial hidden state and it produces not the loss but the output and so this yes are we using gradient descent and not stochastic gradient descent here we we're using stochastic gradient descent with a mini batch size of one So gradient descent without stochastic actually means you're using a mini batch size of the whole data set. So this is kind of the opposite of that. I think this is called online gradient descent. That's a good question. Thank you. So remember earlier on, we had this thing to calculate the vector of outputs, right? So rather than set, so now to do our testing, we're going to create a new function which starts goes from our input to our vector of outputs. And so our predictions will be to take that function, pass it in our initial hidden state, and some input, um, and that's going to give us some predictions. So if we call it, we can now see. All right, let's now grab some um, uh, sequence of text, uh, pass it to our um, function to get some predictions. And let's see what it does. So after t, it expected h. After th, it expected e. After the, it expected space. It actually really wanted a space. After then, it expected a space. After then, question mark, it expected a space. Finally, it got one. After then, question mark, space, it expected a capital T, and so forth. So you can see here um, that we have um, successfully built an RNN from scratch. Using Theano, um, that's been a very, very quick run through. Um, my goal really tonight is to kind of get to a point where you can start to look at this during the week and kind of see all the pieces. Because next week um, we're going to try and build an LSTM in Theano, which is going to mean that you know I want you by next week to start to feel like you've kind of. Got a good understanding of what's going on, so of course, please ask lots of questions on the forum, um, look at the documentation, and so forth. And then the next thing we're going to do after that uh, is we're going to build um, an RNN without using Theano. We're going to use pure NumPy, and that means that we're not going to be able to use t.grad. 
we're going to have to calculate the gradients by hand. Um, so hopefully that will be a, um, a, a useful exercise in, um, in kind of really understanding what's going on in, in backpropagation. Um, so I kind of want to make sure you feel like you've got enough information to get started with looking at Theano this week. So did anybody want to kind of ask any questions uh, about this piece so far? Uh, <laughs> so this is maybe a bit too uh, too far away from what we did today, but how would you apply an RNN to, like, say, images, something other than text? Is that something that's worth doing, and, and if so, what changes about it? Yeah, sure. So the main way in which an RNN is applied to images is what we looked at last week, which is these uh, things called attentional models, which is where you basically say, um, given what you're currently, which part of the um, image you're currently looking at, um, which part would make sense to look at next? This is most useful on really big images, where you can't... Um, this is most useful on really big images where you can't really um, uh, look at the whole thing at once, because it would just eat up all your GPU's RAM, um, and so you can only look at it a little bit at a time. Um, another way that... Um, uh, RNNs are very useful um, let's place that in draw. Um, uh, for images is for captioning images. And so um, we'll talk a lot more about this in the um, next year's course, um, but have a think about this in the meantime. If we've got an image, then a CNN can turn that into a vector representation of that image. For example, we could chuck it through uh, VGG and take the penultimate layer's activations. Say, and there's all kinds of things we could do, but you know, in some way we can turn an image and turn it into um, some vector representation of that. We could do the same thing to a sentence. Um, we can take a sentence consisting of a number of words, and we can stick that through a RNN, and at the end of it, we will get some state, right? And that state is also just a vector. And what we could then do is learn a neural network which maps the picture to the text. Assuming that this sentence was actually originally a caption that had been created for this image right, and so in that way if we can learn a mapping from Some representation of the image that came out of a CNN <coughs> To some representation of a sentence which came out of an RNN Then we could basically reverse that in order to generate captions for an image. So basically what we could then do is we could take some new image that we've never seen before, chuck it through the CNN to get our state out, and then we could figure out what RNN state we would expect would be attached to that based on this neural net that we had learnt, and then we can basically do a sequence generation, just like we have been today. and generate a sequence of words. And this is roughly how um, these uh, image captioning systems that I've shown you, I'm sure you've seen this work. So, um, so RNNs, um, I guess finally the, other, the only other way in which I've seen RNNs applied to images is for like really big 3D images, for example, like in medical imaging. Um, so if you've got some like MRI that's basically a series of layers, right? Um, it's too big to look at the whole thing. Instead, you can use an RNN to start in the top corner and then look one character, one um, pixel to the left, and then one pixel across, and then one pixel back, and then it can go down into the next layer, and it can gradually look one pixel at a time. 
and it can do that and gradually cover the whole thing. And in that way, it's gradually able to generate state about what is contained in this 3D volume. Um, and so this is not something which is very widely used, uh, at least at this point. Um, but I think it's um, it's worth thinking about because again, you could combine this with a CNN. You know, like maybe you could have a CNN that looks at you know um, large chunks of this MRI at a time, right, and generate state for each of these chunks, and then maybe you could use an RNN to go through the chunks. Right? You know, there's all kinds of ways basically that you can combine CNNs and RNNs um, together. So two questions. Um, um, so can you build a custom layer in Viano and then mix it with Keras? Oh, for sure. Yeah, and in fact, it's incredibly easy. Um, so if you go Keras, um, custom Viano layer, I'm guessing. Um, Um, there's lots of examples of them um, that you'll generally find on kind of they're generally kind of in the github issues for Keras um, Where people will kind of show like oh, I was trying to build this layer and I had this problem um, um, But it's kind of a good way to see how to build them um, the other thing I find really useful to do um, is to actually Yeah, here's somebody who's created a merge layer of their own um, the the other thing I find really useful to do is to actually look at the definition of um, the layers in Keras. Um, so one of the things I actually did was I created this little uh, um, thing called PyPath, um, which allows me to put in any um, um, Python module. And it returns the directory that that module is to find in, and then so I can go. Okay, let's have a look at how um, any particular layer is defined. So let's say I want to look at pooling, All right? And so okay, here is a max pooling 1D layer, and you can see it's defined in nine lines of code, right? And so generally speaking. You can kind of see that um, layers don't take um, very much uh, code um, at all. Okay, two more questions. Um, could we, um, given a caption, create an image? Um, yeah, you can absolutely create an image from a caption. There's a lot of um, image generation stuff going on at the moment. Um, it's not at a point that it's probably useful for anything in practice. Um, it's more like a interesting research journey, I guess. Um, uh, so generally speaking, this is uh, in the area called uh, generative models, uh, and we'll be looking at generative models next year because they're very important for unsupervised and semi-supervised learning. And what could get the best performance on a document classification task? A CNN and RNN or both? That's a great 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 question. So let's go back to um, sentiment analysis and To remind ourselves when we looked at sentiment analysis for IMDB the best result we got came from a um, multi-size convolutional neural network where we basically took a bunch of convolutional neural networks of varying sizes um, a simple convolutional network was nearly as good um, so just this very simple convolutional neural network is nearly as good. Um, I actually tried um, an LSTM for this, um, and uh, I found the uh, accuracy that I got um, was less good than the accuracy of the CNN. And I think the reason for this is that when you have a, um, you know, a whole movie review, which is a few paragraphs, um, the information you can get just by looking at a few words at a time is enough to tell you whether this is like a positive review or a, 
or a negative review, you know. If if you see like a sequence of five words like this is totally shit, you know, you can probably learn that's not a good thing. Um, or else if it's this is totally awesome, you can probably learn that is a good thing. The amount of nuance built into reading sentence word by word an entire review, it just doesn't seem like there's there's any need for that in practice. And so in general for once you get to a certain sized piece of text, um, like a paragraph or two, um, there doesn't seem to be any sign that R and Ns are helpful, at least at, at this stage. Okay, so before I closed off, I wanted to just show you two little tricks, because I don't spend enough time showing you cool little tricks, and so when I was working with Brad today, there was two little tricks that um, we realized that other people might like to learn about. Um, the first trick I wanted to point out to you is um, how do you um, if you want to learn um, about uh, how a function works, um, what would be a quick way to find out? Um, and uh, if you hit, if you've got a function there on your screen and you hit Shift Tab, um, all of the parameters to it will pop up. Uh, if you hit Shift Tab twice, um, the documentation will pop up. Um, so that was one little tip that I wanted you guys to know about because I think it's pretty handy. Um, the second little tip that you may not have been aware of is that you can actually run the Python debugger inside Jupyter Notebook. And so today we were trying to do that when we were trying to debug our pure Python uh, RNN. Um, so we can see an example of that. Uh, so let's say we were having some problem inside our loop here. We can go import PDB, that's the Python debugger, and then you can set a breakpoint anywhere. So you can go PDB set trace, that's the breakpoint. And so now if I run that, as soon as it gets to here, it pops up a little dialog box. And at this point, I can look at anything. So for example, I can say, okay, what's the value of er at this point? And I can say, okay, well, what are the lines I'm about to execute? And then I can say, okay, execute the next one line. And it shows me what line is coming next. So um, if you want to uh, learn about the Python debugger, just Google for a Python debugger, um, but uh, learning to use the debugger is one of the most helpful things because it lets you step through each um, step of what's going on and see the values of all of your variables um, and uh, uh, do all kinds of cool stuff like that. So those were two little tips I thought I would leave you with um, so we can finish on a high note. And that's nine o'clock. Thanks very much everybody.